Welcome to a day of prayer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Together, let's engage in relationship with Christ through prayer, faith, and His Word. Good morning. I'm Promise, and you're listening to Day of Prayer's Morning Bible Study. We're glad you could join us. But before we get into the Word, let's open up in prayer. Well, I just thank you for today. Just thank you for coming into our midst and just giving us your instruction and making it where it's very detailed so that there's not an area that we can miss. Well, I also just thank you for just being with us all the time. Mm Mm-hmm. In the name of Jesus, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome, everybody. We're excited to have you with us as we continue our series and discussion on the Lord's house. This morning, we are going to continue. We're in Exodus 25, and we're going to cover verses 10 through 22. So could I get a volunteer to read that section of scripture, please? I will. All right, Layla. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out you shall overlay it, and shall make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. Hmm. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give to you, that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Mm-hmm. Wow. Amen. Amen. There's a lot in there. <laughs> so, um. It's going to take us a minute to, to unpack everything that's contained in here. Um, but uh, I want to say this, right? Again, as we've already pointed out here in the, especially this week, and these last few couple of podcasts, everything in here is speaking to or about Jesus, Mm -hmm. a type and a shadow of things to come. Um, Notice how there are two parts here, right? Yes. Yes. There is the mercy seat, which is the the covering, the top. And then there is this, um, the ark or the box part, right? Yes. Yes. Does everybody understand why there are two parts? Do tell us. Okay. Let's turn to Job 9. Now, Job is important. Yeah, for <laughs> a lot of, I mean, the whole word is important. Mm-hmm. But scholars will tell you that Job was the first written book of the Bible. So let me get to I'm getting to Job chapter nine. Forgive me. Okay. And I believe it's verse thirty-three. Um, so, actually, could I have a 
volunteer read Job 9, verses 30 through 33, please. I will. Actually, 30 through 35. Okay. Job 9, verses 30 through 35. If I wash myself with snow water and cleanse my hands with soap, yet you will plunge me into the pit, and my own clothes will abhor me. For he is not a man, as I am, that I may answer him, and that we should go to court together. Nor is there any mediator between us, who may lay his hand on us both. Let him take his rod away from me, and do not let dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. Mm. So when all of that is important, that outlines a few different things. One, it's not our works that get us to our salvation and eternal life, right? That's what he's talking about in the first part. Even if I wash myself with still water, I'm still guilty. Right? Yes. Uh, and this is part of Job's complaints to the Lord. Right? In this section. But in verses 32 and 33, he makes an interesting statement. He's not a man as I am, that I may answer him, and that we should go to court together. And then in verse 33, here's the key part. Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hands on us both. The ark is in two parts. Speaking of Jesus as man and as God. Amen. There are two parts to this. Lay us, right? That's, that's what Job asked for this Amen. here. Again, first book, according to scholars, first book written in the Bible. He asked for it, for a mediator, right? Yes. Yes. Again, yes. all this speaks to Christ. Mm -hmm. um, can I get a volunteer to go to Ephesians 3 and read verses, it's really 8 through 21 for, for everyone that you know can look it up in their free time, but can I get someone to read verses 16 through 21? Okay, Ephesians chapter 3, 16 through 21. Yes. Because this is how it pertains to us. Okay. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So when you hear those, what we just read in Ephesians, what is the first thing you think of? Length and breadth and depth. A shape. Okay. Shaped like a box, right? That's right. Yes. The, the Ark of the Covenant, is that not a box? Yes. Okay. It's a rectangular box. It is. Mm -hmm. But those boxes are typically the most of where you look for those type of dimensions, right? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Amen. So do we do we see a, a pattern here forming? Amen. We see a correlation. Okay. Absolutely. Now, that's not the only places, right? Mm -hmm. Because... Again, uh, and Amen. Paul has this uh, apostolic prayer right again <laughs> that mm -hmm. he's he prays that the people get this and understand it. And this is a Holy Spirit inspired prayer. Paul Amen. Didn't sit down and go, "What's the best thing I could pray for these people?" Right. That, that he continued from mm -hmm. really from chapter one, Ephesians one, but in and even in Ephesians chapter two, he's talking about this this mediator um, towards the end of chapter two. And now he's praying in chapter 3 that they understand it, right? Right. Remembering yes. that Paul was a Pharisee, Saul was mm -hmm. a Pharisee of Pharisees uh, in his upbringing. And he had to be taught how to see Christ, just like when Christ explained himself to the disciples to see so that they could understand him throughout scriptures. Paul had to go through the same thing where God would say, you know, 
and all the knowledge that he had that thought he thought excluded Jesus Christ points to Jesus Christ. So in this, God is teaching the apostle and through his lifetime, as he has been converted, teaching him about himself and how he truly is the Messiah, how he is represented literally in everything, especially that the um, Judeans or the Hebrews held dear as a part of their religion and, and their lack of understanding caused them to persecute Christ and his followers and to deny him when really it's pointing them to him where they should accept him and love him. So now he's expressing liberty and the Holy Spirit's ministering and all of those things. Absolutely. <clears throat> and now, um, could someone also go to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 23 through 24, please? Daddy said verses 23 and 24? Yes, please. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Hmm. So, Paul here, or there's some debate on who wrote Hebrews, whether it was Paul or whether it was Luke. Um, I'm my assessment is Paul, so I'm just going to state that. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so it's written here that direct Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, right? And, and it also says that in the Gospels where he talks about, I'll uh, say during the Last Supper, this is the what? The new covenant in my blood. Mm -hmm. The blood yes. was sprinkled on the mercy seat, Amen. right? Yes. To do what? Provide atonement for the people. Okay. Atonement, propitiation for sins. Okay, so the two sides is the children of Israel had the sacrifice, and yearly they would put the blood, sprinkle the, the mm -hmm. congregation. They would sacrifice the heifers, sprinkle the congregation, put the blood on the mercy seat for the annual covering of their sins. Jesus being the propitiation, he blotted out by his blood being put on the heavenly mercy seat on our behalf. So there's the initial, the annual thing was a type and shadow. Yes. But it was temporary. It was never meant to continue in, and endure permanently. But the blood of Jesus is the permanent um, Amen. removing of our sin, not covering it, not throwing a blanket on it, Correct. not um, for it to spring up later. But it is gone forever in the sea of forgetfulness under his blood. And that blood has been placed on the heavenly mercy seat. So that's a final and final act and a permanent, whereas the first one was a placeholder. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And who did that? Which one? Who put on, who sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat? The high, the high priest. The high priest. And, and we were we just discussing here this right. week about Jesus being our great high priest. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can yes. I, someone also read 1 Timothy 2.5? First Timothy two five. Yes, sir. I'll read it. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now Lord it brings God. us all the way back to Job, right? Yeah. He said to lay his hands on us both, right, between God and men. To bridge the gap. There is one mediator. Mm -hmm. Let's also, if if anybody recalls, when Adam and well. I, at that point, it was Eve, right? Her name had been changed from woman to Eve mm -hmm. under the curse, and they were removed from the garden. What did you see? What did the Lord say was put there? The angel with the sword. Cherubim. Two cherubim mm -hmm. with a sword in between, a flaming sword in between. And there is also scripture that says what? That the word of the Lord is a flaming sword, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll let you look that up. I didn't. I didn't look that one up. There's, there's a lot of scripture that we're going to be going through in this. Um, but th do you not see the exact thing here with the um, with the mercy seat? And and we already read the scripture where it says, and the Lord, actually he he says it here plainly in um, verse twenty two, between uh, sorry tw verse twenty one and twenty two of Exodus twenty five says, you shall put the mercy on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you, and there 
I will meet with you and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, mm -hmm. about everything that I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Do we see the, the same pattern, same similarity, right? Types and shadows of things to come. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Is everybody tracking so far? Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot, yes. uh, and we still have a lot to go, because um, I want to cover this in full. There are in this this uh, ark, and the whole thing is made of acacia wood, right? Uh, other versions may say shittim wood, right? Um, which is a a type of acacia uh, mm -hmm. from the acacia tree family as it were is very strong durable solid wood right and of course yes. and this is overlaid with gold as we read but there so we we talked about how this is two parts hmm. one representing man right jesus christ as man mm -hmm. and one representing him as god mm -hmm. right so let's yes. look at the ark part representing christ as man there were three items placed in the ark and you'll find those in hebrews 9 verses 4 and 5 so who would like to read that Is it hebrews 9 mm -hmm. i can read it oh you can go ahead promise i'm there all right sir let's hear it which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant over, overlaid on all sides with gold, and which were the golden pot that, ha that had the man manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowed the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Hmm. Okay, so three things. The golden pot of manna, <clears throat> Aaron's rod or Aaron's staff that bloomed, and the the written, the commandments, right? Yes. Okay. Why were those three items placed in the ark? Besides the obvious answer of the Lord told them to put them God there. That said so. That, that, that is, of course, the given answer yes. because the Lord said it, so we should do it. Amen. He told them to do it. We shall be obedient to do what he says. Mm -hmm. And the Lord does nothing without there being, uh, it's just his manifold wisdom, uh, an infinitesimal amount of reasons. Purpose. Why? And purpose behind mm -hmm. what he does. We, unfortunately, don't always understand the why, but that's the question for today. Why those three items? Well, I, mean, I actually never contemplated it, but it would seem it would be, you know, the manna being the bread of life that comes down from heaven. Okay. A rep another representation of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the new life from the dead branch, again, representation of Christ being resurrected, and then God's word. Okay. That's all we need. Okay. Uh, and that is a good, good over, overview, overarching answer there, brother. I, I appreciate it. Well, let's get into some deeper details. All right. Um, so first, we, 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 Paul already talks about the items in the ark, right? But let's look at those. Um, so we're going to start with the golden pot of manna. That's in Exodus 16, verses 32 through 35, I believe. Yeah. About the answer, yes. Okay, let's say promise had an answer. Oh, you have an answer? Well, let's hear it, sir. Yes, the manna, because that literally came from God. The route because that was work of God, and in the tablet, the original ones, God wrote that. Yes. Amen. He did write Amen. it. Amen. So, right, let's start. It is verse. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can I get a volunteer to read Exodus sixteen thirty-two through, uh, actually thirty-one through thirty-five. <coughs> I will. 
All right, Layla. Mm-hmm. And the house of Israel called its name manna, and it was like white coriander seed, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Then Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer with it, to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer of manna in it, and lay it up before the Lord, to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And the children of Israel ate manna forty years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Mm-hmm. So you see right there, he describes the manna and tells them to take a pot and put an omer, an omer and an, and others say an omer is one tenth of an ephah, um, but it's to lay it up before. The testimony uh, before the Lord to be kept for the generations, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, now let's go to Deuteronomy eight thirteen. I'm there. All right, sir. Would you mind reading that? What verse am I supposed to stop at? Uh, just verse 13. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe, that you may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God leads you in all the way these forty years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commands or not. So he humbled you. And te- yes, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, which your fathers, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Your garments did mm-hmm. not wear out, on you nor did your feet swell these 40 years you should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son so the lord your god chastens you therefore you shall keep the command commandments of the lord your god to walk in your to walk in his ways and to fear him for the lord your god is bringing you into a good land a land of brooks of water of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills a land of wheat and barley of vines and fig trees and pomegranates a land of olive oil and honey a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity in which you will lack nothing a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you shall you can dig copper okay this does not sound very familiar to what we're already seeing here in the tabernacle what the lord has describing on what they should bring this this land possesses everything, right? Yes. yes. But in Deuteronomy 8, um, six, uh, 16, it talks about how they were fed with manna. And then again, to remember, it's, and that's in verse 18, the Lord your God, and it's he who gives you power to get wealth, and He that he may establish the covenant which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day, right? Mm. Yes. Um, let's also go to Psalm... 78 verse 24 verse 24 I believe so let me I'm getting there so I gotta yes. dig through um, <laughs> many of these uh, bookmarks um, Yes, so uh, 23 and 20 through 25, please. I'll read it. Okay. Had rained down manna on them to eat and gave them of the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. Mm-hmm. Amen. And let's go to Nehemiah 9. Oh, 
I want to say it's verses 5 and 22. <clears throat> All right, a lot of notes, and sometimes it's kind of hard to read my own writing. So I apologize. It's okay. Uh, do you think that verse is worthy? I believe it's verse 5. Oh, ain't there. What's it say, sir? It says, and the Levites, Joshua, Cadmi, Bani, Hashanabina. No, I don't believe that's it. Let's do this a different way. Or are you looking for Nehemiah 9? Mm, let's say like 18 through 21. That might be it. Yes, that sounds about right. I think it's 15 through 22. 15 through 22, please. Okay. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst and told them to go in to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. Hmm. But they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they hardened their necks, and in the rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. Even when they made a molded calf for themselves and said, This is your God that brought you up out of Egypt and worked great provocations. Yet in your manifold mercies you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Mm. Now, do we notice a pattern here? Yes. In most of these verses, it speaks of every time man is mentioned, the commandments are mentioned, right? Yes. Okay. So that's one. And we also said all of this speaks of Jesus, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. So now can I get a volunteer to read, go to John 6 and read verse 30, verses 32 through 35. John 6, verses 32 through 35. Yes, sir. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Hmm. So do we see the connection now? Put the bread in, in this ark, right? The Ark of the Covenant, because it speaks as a type and shadow of Christ. Mm -hmm. He said, he is the bread of life. Mm -hmm. They shall never hunger or thirst. If we look at John 6, it, do we not see a similarity? While in the wilderness, the children of Israel were fearful or complaining about not knowing where their food was going to come from, right? Yes. Then we see the same thing here in John 6. The disciples didn't know where the food was going to come from for the people. Jesus provided it. But not only that, he made the connection to what is what was placed inside the Ark of the Covenant. He said, I am the bread of life. Okay? Yes. yes. It, it matters. It's important. And I'll... Uh, there's still more to cover, but um, we're going to pause there for today because there's a lot in there. And um, I want to give people, you know, the listeners, time to to review it, to search the scriptures, to hear from the Holy Spirit for themselves. Mm -hmm. And and of course, if, if there are any questions, 
please reach out. You can contact us at adayofprayer.org. That's our website. Or directly through email at adayofprayer.yahoo.com. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to connect with you. I'd love to discuss the word with you. Mm-hmm. So let's pause there. And with that, can I get a volunteer to close out in prayer, please? I will. All right, sir. Lord, I just thank you, Lord. And I just thank you that you're consistent, Lord. And Lord, I also just thank you that you've given us these instructions, Lord, so that way we can look back on it, Lord, and see how you are, Lord. And Lord, we also just thank you that when you give us Lord, these instructions, Lord, it's not to oppress us, Lord, but it's so that we, we can learn more about you, Lord, and learn that you have a specific reason for everything you say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we love you. God bless you. And have a wonderful day. Thank you for listening to A Day of Prayer. We trust the Lord that you are strengthened and encouraged in your relationship with Christ. Visit us on our website, adayofprayer.org, where you can check out our blog, find additional study resources, or shop the official A Day of Prayer store. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So until next time, take care and God bless you.